So I'm looking at using pH responsive nanoparticles for targeted drug delivery. So first, just like a little bit of an overview of how that's going to work. So the idea was to make these polymeric nanoparticles that were 100 nanometers in size and load them with a drug. And that size is super important because it's large enough that the nanoparticles can't easily escape from the blood vessels into healthy tissues, but they can leak from the blood vessels out of unhealthy pores into tumor sites. So once the nanoparticles are into the tumor and then into the cell, this is where the sort of pH responsive side kicks in, and it's going to help those nanoparticles to disassemble into their unimeric polymer state and release that drug selectively within the cell. Those unimeric polymers are then going to be cleared from the body quite easily, so we expect them to be excreted out the kidneys and just into the urine. So a bit more about my particles in specific. So again, we want them to be 100 nanometers. That's the 102 nanometers, if we're going to be specific about this, but it's close enough. They have this peg corona on the outside. So that's helping to stabilize and solubilize those nanoparticles. And it's also sort of helping to hide them from the immune system a touch. But importantly, it's also giving them a very neutral surface charge. So the Z temperature is about zero. And that helps cut down on a lot of toxicity effects, as well as problems with protein binding. The inside of the nanoparticle is then when things get a bit more functional. So I'm using this monomer dipimer. So it's under neutral conditions, it's hydrophobic. But below about pH 4.5, it protonates and the polymer becomes both hydrophilic and cationic. So that buildup of charge and loss of hydrophobicity is going to help these nanoparticles really rapidly disassemble. And importantly, that's all going to happen around the pH of the lysosome that the nanoparticle is going to encounter as it enters the cell. So to check that responsiveness, we just use BLS. So that's looking at the size of the nanoparticles versus pH. So from basic through neutral pHs, they're very stable around 100 nanometers, followed by this sudden disassembly around pH 4.5 down to their unimeric unfolded state. So that pH happens about 4.7 in this instance, and it's very rapid. So 25 milliseconds is the fastest that I can actually measure the disassembly, and it's still happening within 25 milliseconds. And that's important, because if you want your nanoparticle to disassemble in itself, you don't want it to have to take a long time, or if you run the risk of the nanoparticle being cleared from the cell before it's fully so before we did an in vivo, we just did a few in vitro experiments. So we checked that it were non-toxic against cell lines as well as multicellular organisms. In this case, we used Galeria. And we also just checked that they did actually enter cells, which they do, and surprisingly rapidly. So they reach almost 50% uptake within half an hour and near quantitative uptake within three hours. So they're being very rapidly internalized, which again is good for if you want to deliver selectively. So just a little bit about the drug, because it's a bit of a new one. So it's called FY26. It's this osmium-based anti-cancer drug. It's very potent, so about 49 times more effective than cisplatin. But it does have problems with poor water solubility and high toxicity. So encapsulating it within a nanoparticle seems to be the way to go there. So to do the encapsulation, it's quite easy. You just take a nanoparticle solution and literally put the drug in with it and shake it for at least 24 hours. And during that time, the drug partitions into the nanoparticle simply because it's more soluble in the polymer phase. You then will always have some drug left over in the aqueous phase. So to purify it, you use centrifugal dialysis where you effectively just spin the particle very fast to separate out any free drug from encapsulated drug. And you get quite good encapsulation efficiencies, so above 75%, which is about the theoretical limit for this drug to partition coefficient. So then on to the in vivo. So we took male mice and we grew two tumors subcutaneously on either flank. And importantly, these tumors were grown from a mouse liver cancer cell line. And it's important they came from a mouse liver cancer. It's important they came from a mouse cancer cell line because it meant we could use mice that 
still have fully functional immune systems, which then become important when you're looking at what happens to the mammoth cells later. So these mice were then dosed at five mg per kilo with either the drug by itself or the same concentration of drug just encapsulated within the mammoth particle. And then we're going to look at the uptake of that drug into either these what are effectively liver tumors versus the mouse's healthy liver. So on to the uptake. So this is the uptake of the drug into the liver. So first thing that I just want to point out, the free drug had very high uptake and very rapid uptake into the liver, followed by clearance and excretion from the body. And that's pretty much what you'd expect for a small molecule drug. The encapsulated drug, on the other hand, which again, we've designed to avoid healthy tissue, quite effectively dodged the liver. So it only has very low levels of uptake throughout. Then, when you look at the tumor, the free drug still has okay uptake into the tumor, but I should point out that the scale on this y axis is now 10 times smaller than the other. So, versus the liver, it's not been very selective for the tumor. Whereas you are now starting to see that there is encapsulated drug entering the tumor. So, I find these graphs a little bit hard to look at. So an easier way to discuss them is to look at the selectivity. So you just simply divide how much of the drug went to the tumor site by how much of it went to the liver site. So this then gives us this selectivity factor graph. So for the free drug in gray, you can see there's very low selectivity. So it's always about 0.1, which is showing that it's strongly favoring liver uptake which again is not where you want the drug to be. Whereas the encapsulated drug that's been designed to passively accumulate within tumors, which is a selectivity factor greater than one, which is showing that it's got a positive bias towards tumor uptake. And the difference in selectivity is actually quite significant. So it's about a 15 fold difference. So you really are starting to improve that selectivity. So, I've shown that the drug by itself enters into the tumor more than the encapsulated drug. So you might be wondering why we sort of want to bother. And I have an unfortunately poignant example of why. So for the free drug group, one of the mice unfortunately died between the 24 hour and the 48 hour time points of the experiment. And that fatality wasn't coming from the cancer cell line. It was just coming from the fact that anti-cancer drugs are very toxic and accumulation of them into healthy tissues can have very negative consequences. Meanwhile, for the encapsulated drug group, we never saw any evidence of such cytotoxic effects. So while you're not necessarily improving the amount of drugs you're delivering, you're significantly improving the selectivity, which at the end of the day is what really matters. So I've sort of got a big summary of everything wrapping it all up. So we made peg defined nanoparticles and we showed that they disassemble very rapidly and very specifically at lysosomal pH. They're non-toxic against both single cell and multicellular organisms, and they have a very high and rapid internalization into cells, which makes them ideal as drug delivery vehicles. The nanoparticles you make can be very easily loaded with an anti-cancer drug and purified by centrifugal dialysis afterwards. And the main, if you take nothing else from this presentation, take home message is that the encapsulation significantly improves selectivity, selective uptake into the tumor over the liver. And with that, I just want to thank my old supervisor, Professor Sebastian Perrier, as well as the Perrier group as a whole. And of course, I'd like to thank all my collaborators, both from biology and the organometallic experts who provide us with this drug, and of course, all my funders, as well as you guys for listening. I hope you have some questions. And I thank you very much, Robert. Stop serving. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, very interesting talk, lovely slides. Um, so we have a couple of questions in there. Um, 
maybe we can start off why you can explain uh, what's the action of the osmium-based drug? Can you say briefly, how does the, how does the, what's the mechanism of action? So this one, I can bring back up the structure if it helps, but basically one of the ligands undergoes a reaction with GSH, which is normally at elevated levels within cancer cells. And once that reaction has happened, the osmium center can displace an iodide ligand and it all becomes quite a lot more active. It then generates reactive oxygen species which go on to basically to nuke everything in the cell. Thank you. Uh, there's a question here from Paolo, which a question I was gonna ask as well. Can you maybe just give us a summary of why you think this selectivity occurs? Mm -hmm. And do you think you could approve on it? So I think the two big things that are important for the selectivity is the drug is injected by IP, so into the peritoneal cavity. And from the peritoneal cavity, you can then escape into the body as a whole, mainly by going through the lymph nodes, which are then the centers of your immune system where everything's gonna get detected. My nanoparticles are 100 nanometers, are too large, to easily enter a lymph node. So they're straight away dodging the immune system a lot more than the drug by itself. They're fortunately small enough that they can still escape the cavity asaily. The next thing that's then helping the selectivity the other way is once the drug and the nanoparticles are into the healthy blood vessels, when they get to the tumor tissue site, with the exception of the CUFA cells, which are quite good at taking things out of the blood vessels, there aren't very many openings in that blood vessel for the nanoparticle to physically escape into the healthy tissue. Whereas at the tumor site, you do have these very unhealthy large pores in the lining of your blood barrier, just because the tumor site has grown so quickly and irregularly. So they're gonna end up passively accumulated there. So it's sort of a twofold. It's dodging the immune system by being too big, but being small enough that they passively accumulate within a tumour. Very interesting. Uh, I'm not sure I completely agree with this idea of having holes in blood vessels, fenestrations. Okay. Uh, but that's a different discussion. Um, and I think the, you know, the uptake is possibly more to do with an inflamed endothelium mm -hmm. uh, and having an active uptake. But very interesting. Uh, there's loads of questions here. Maybe we'll have one more. Um, uh, so in terms of the, um, do you think that if you put a, a targeting system on it, it would improve? And yeah, that, that, that's, let's just ask that question. It's a yes and a no. So the problem becomes, if you make your nanoparticle deliberately very bioactive, so say you put sugars on the surface, because some cancer cell lines have an increased number of sugar receptors. You're then also gonna start switching on the immune system a lot more to that nanoparticle. So you might then start seeing that you're getting improved uptake into the tumors, but also a negative increase in how much is going into your liver. So you might then start messing with your selectivity 